Hey everyone, this is Micah. I'm just doing some questing here in Daggerfall. And I was thinking a little bit about how, um, whenever I was playing Oblivion back in the day, I'm looking for alchemists and armor stores right now. Um, yeah, I was playing Oblivion way, way long time ago. I had the Shivering Isles expansion and was totally into it. And I was like 13 or 14 at the time. And uh, back in those old days, I would... I got this idea in my mind that, you know, if I enchanted one piece of armor, I could put a little bit of, like, you know, 10 or 15% chameleon on it, uh, then go to a ring and put 10 to 15% chameleon on it, and then go to another piece of armor, put 10 or 15% chameleon on it. You get the idea, right? Soon I just have 100% chameleon. It's like you're completely invisible, but it doesn't have the normal effect of, you know, whenever you attack, you're being uh, forced out of your invisibility. And in this way, I just completely, you know, walked through the entire DLC of the Shivering Isles. Um, and I, I think that's a common experience in games like this. Like, you find an exploit that lets you feel really, really powerful, and you stick with it. You know, I was kind of like going, I was kind of going blindly from one quest marker or quest objective to the next without really doing much um, on the way in between those uh, quest objectives. And uh, yeah, like I was saying, I think this is a common experience for many people. Um, I played the Elder Scrolls games like that, at least Oblivion, that was my first RPG, so it's kind of where I grew up as a, an RPG player in many ways. Um, eventually though, I got kind of bored of being this demigod that was using I don't even know if that was a, uh, an exploit. I'm not even describing like the duplication glitch or anything like that. That was just a game mechanic that I used to make myself really, really strong. And, uh, you know, I really actually cheated myself out of a satisfying challenge. And, um, you know, I fast traveled between every event and it prevented me from having a, a meaningful experience, at least what I would call a meaning, meaningful experience in uh, my perspective today. And so that that's just one example of how these Elder Scrolls games are easily breakable. Although, you know, as a kid, whenever I was doing that, I simply made the decision to make the game breakable and, in my opinion, just frankly boring. And, um, you know, we're, we're still faced with that decision whenever we play an Elder Scrolls game. If you want to exploit it and have fun that way, that's, you know, perfectly fine. Uh, these days, I like to challenge myself just a little bit more. Um, I'm just looking for a bow, by the way. My, I had a mithril bow that broke, and so now I just use this little piece of shit um, that won't damage powerful enemies. So I'm looking. For, I'm just on the market for a new bow. Um, anyway, uh, the way I was playing previously, it's not to my taste now. Um, this game allows for a lot of power trips. You know, that, I can say that about like um, Daggerfall, but really applies to every Elder Scrolls game. You can make really, really powerful characters, but the game also gives you opportunities to make really silly, janky characters who are more down to earth and they're still heroic. You know, you can still just level up, you can still defeat monsters and complete quests, and even like the main quest, the big bad evil guy, you can kill anything you want, even with a really ordinary hero. There's no alchemist here, no weaponsmiths. Okay, gotta keep going south. Um, you'll just have a bit more. F Fun? Ah, this is like, you know, I mentioned in my last video, fun is a weird word. You'll be more engaged, I think, if you have a more humble and ordinary hero in your game. Um, and while, if you're anything like me, you've played like almost every Elder Scrolls game, at least Morrowind, Oblivion, Skyrim, one of those, or all three, you've played it to death. You've seen like all the in-game content, you've completed all the quests at least once, likely multiple times. Um, but why do we keep playing these games if we have explored seemingly all the content that it has available? Like, I swear, I've seen every dungeon in Oblivion. It can't pull a fast one on me. I've seen it all, man. So why do I still boot that game up and play it every now and then? And why do I still play Daggerfall and things like that? Um, these games have a strength in being sandboxes. They have a strength in letting you do whatever you want um, and create characters that are 
kind of flawed and sometimes quirky and still super viable and still a lot of fun. Uh, I really think that's one of the strengths of the Elder Scrolls series, even though the the base games are often, you know, say what you will about them, they're not the um, the greatest, they don't, they don't have a huge reputation um, for being well developed and things like that. Oh, which way do I go? I think I'm just going south. Um, but they are a great sandbox and they allow you a lot of character customization and a lot of room for um, fleshing out your character with things like um, ambitions and goals, fears and things that they are averse to, and just their overall personality. Um, let's see. And whenever you make a character with these in mind, their ambitions, what they are um, averse to or what they dislike, and what their overall personality traits are, um, it often leads to a more dynamic and, in my opinion, engaging role-playing experience. And so, you know, playing a game like Daggerfall, if you're new to it, it's going to be pretty intimidating. Um, just gonna find where this alchemist is. Oh, she actually doesn't know. Uh, okay, she doesn't know anything. Um, one second, gotta find out where the alchemist is. I think he already marked it. Uh, this guy doesn't know anything. Um, let's get an armor. We have a few options here. All right. Uh, anyway, whenever you have a character that has a kind of defined personality that makes them unique and you're not just going into every uh, den of monsters with the intention of slaughtering all of them and you're not just blindly moving from one quest marker to another, um, and you really put yourself in the shoes of the character. Um, I, that's, this is where like these games uh, really shine to me. Uh, Elven Brigandine, what do I have? All right. Um, so typically, if you're going about your merry way and some complications arise, um, you might have to put whatever quest you're on or whatever dungeon you're going to kind of on the back burner while you solve... Um, the problem presented by, like I mentioned before, I'm like, I'm out of a good bow. I really need a good bow if I want to feel prepared for things. Um, this is just one example of emergent narrative and the way Elder Scrolls is kind of conducive to emergent narratives. If you're not familiar with the term, an emergent narrative is basically a story that arises from circumstance. It's not the main story in itself. Um, it just happens, uh, I think in the case of Elder Scrolls games, emergent narrative arises with a com uh, combination of your character, and the, like your character's personality, and the situation they find themselves in. Uh, typically whenever you're taking a more power gamey approach, you're always going to be in control of the situation, and um, it's fine if you enjoy the game like that, but I really like whenever the situation takes control of me a little bit and I'm forced to adapt to dangerous circumstances and I, um, you know, I, I find out more things about myself as the player and my character. Why not? Let's get another heal true. Whenever emergent narrative is allowed to exist in the game and uh, let's see, invisibility will be helpful eventually. Yeah, emergent narrative is just a, a really great spice that you can find in Elder Scrolls games. It's not a necessary component of any of them. It all comes down to the way you pilot the game, and that's part of what makes it so beautiful. You can play the um, kind of power gamey character, or you can play um, a really, really silly Gimp's character, or something in the middle, um, and allow emergent narrative to steer your gameplay. Um, so. If you only perform the quests that are given to you by these games, you're gonna just like you're gonna run out of quests to do. Like I wouldn't say really fast, but you could do everything that Skyrim has to offer to you in one playthrough, literally. Like it, it doesn't restrict you at all. And um, I eventually like you're gonna run out of quests to do. I think I've played almost every quest offered by Skyrim, and yet I still replay it because I still can think of like characters that I think would be interesting that have their own sets of limitations and rules to abide by. Dwarven Shortbow, is this gonna... I don't think that's really strong enough to hit enemies that are um, immune to regular weapons, but I'm gonna buy it just in case. Uh, what else we got? What else we got? I'm just gonna keep looking here real quick. Anything good? No? Alright. 
Um, so yeah, I whenever I play games like this, this guy's a bit of a criminal, so I always get freaked out whenever I see a cop like that. Uh, yeah, so whenever I play games like this, I really like to have a sort of set of rules and restrictions that apply to my characters that um, they, they might seem boring at first, uh, perhaps they literally are boring, but they add new dimensions to the game that I uh, that just brings new life to them. And so I want to talk a little bit about emergent narrative and roleplay restrictions and how these things make uh, an immense amount of replay value, almost like an infinite amount of replay value. At least that's how I've tricked my brain into viewing the game. Um, so I like, like I said, I like to make some suboptimal characters because, you know, whenever you think about it, each of us as we're going about our day to day, day, -to -day lives, we're pretty suboptimal. Um, even whenever we're trying our hardest and we're in like, you know, eating healthily, staying hydrated, exercising regularly, we're still going to um, come, we're still going to fall short of some of our goals and situations are going to get the best of us and, you know, th that's okay. Um, that's just because we are people and this is a, a result of that. And, you know, these characters that we play in RPGs, they're also people. They have limitations and, um... So I try to kind of allow those flaws to exist. Oh man, I got kind of stuck on a wall there. Let's go over here and then fast travel again. Uh, so yeah, I want to talk a little bit about... Oh man, I've got to climb over these mountains to get there. This, this mod is kind of making the fast travel thing a little bit difficult. So yeah, we're all flawed individuals, and the characters that we play are f can be flawed, they don't have to be. Um, but there's actually a literary precedent for roleplay restrictions, and of course the flawed or tragic hero. Um, one of my favorites, uh, I just found a dungeon by the way, uh, where are we? I actually found a map of this, I mentioned I was questing earlier, that's not entirely true, I'm waiting for the next quest to come find me. Um, in the main quest. This is my Iron Man character, by the way, so I could very well just, like, lose my character if I'm not careful here, but, uh, who gives a shit? I just want to try to, uh, make some progress while I'm chatting today. Alright, so, literary precedents for roleplay restrictions and things like that. Um, one of the first things that came to my mind whenever I thought about this topic was, um, Fawford and the Grey Mouser. It's this story by... I don't know how to pronounce his name, you know, it's like Fritz Lieber, maybe? Maybe it's Fritz Lieber? Anyway, um, this story of Fawford and the Grey Mouser, there, it's a series of stories about two thieves. One of them is more of a traditional thief, and one of them is a, uh, kind of like a barbarian. But they are so dedicated to their thievery that they make a bold claim in one of their stories. I, I forget which one. Oh, shit. That's kind of scary. Uh... They make a bold claim in one of their stories that they have never... Oh wow, this is terrifying. Let's get them to fight each other. Alright, come on. Okay, don't paralyze me. That's one ghost down. I'm just going to run away and let the orc and ghost fight themselves. Um, Fawford and the Grey Mouser, they've never paid for anything that they own. They make this bold claim that they have either stolen everything that, that they own, or they have... Um, the ghost followed me here. Who's fighting the shaman then? Oh, this is sad. Healing potion already. Let's take care of these guys real quick. I'll set up camp and tell you this story. Alright. Um, Fawford and the Grey Mouser, they make the claim that they have never purchased anything that they own. And uh, they just kind of loot it from dungeons. Oh, there's the shaman. Oh, that hurt. Uh, don't die, don't die, don't die, don't die, don't die. Be out of spell points, please. Oh, that was kind of scary. I I'm so scared that this character's gonna die to, um, uh, to, to some sort of spellcaster. So Fawford and the Grey Mouser have this roleplay restriction that they don't pay for things. They pay for drinks and, like, hotel rooms or rooms at the inn or whatever, but they don't pay for anything that they own. But they don't have a house, right? And so they have this hilarious goal that they create based on their roleplay restrictions, so to speak, or their own quirks. Um, 
where they steal a house so they can have some permanent place to sleep and they hire a bunch of people in town or convince them to uh, go out beneath the blocks of a house and like lift it up and they like uh, roll it across town somewhere else so that they can have a house. They, they literally just pick up and steal a house. I tell you man, like if you haven't read the Fritz Leiber, Fawford and the Grey Mouser stories, um, please get on top of that. You, you won't regret it. They're kind of like sword and sorcery stories where, um, you know, it's not high fantasy by any degree. Uh, I really need to free up my... I normally don't carry a shield with this guy. It just fit with the outfit, but I'm getting kind of tired of it. Um, they're sword and sorcery stories. It's not epic fantasy like Lord of the Rings or anything like that. It's just two dudes thugging it out, basically. Um... But that's part of the charm. I kind of I've started preferring that kind of literature these days. Um, some smelly raw meat. Let's cook it real quick. Oh, I can't cook on this fire. That's a shame. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a sword and sorcery series, kind of like um, the Conan the Barbarian series, except like Fritz Leiber has a sense of humor. He's not super grim all the time. He doesn't have those suicidal tendencies that you'd find in Robert Howard's stories um, slash person. Uh, I have nothing to cook. What the hell? Don't I have the raw meat? It's just called meat. Did I already cook it? Whatever. I'm eating it. Uh, anyway, go read Fawford and the Grey Mouser stories. They're, they're fantastic. Uh, speaking of Conan, he also has some roleplay restrictions in that he just really hates decadence. Uh, you know, it's like if he were to go into a palace in Daggerfall and be assigned some sort of quest... Uh, by a nobleman who wants him to deliver a package, he would probably spit in their face, kick over a table, and, uh, you know, he, he has some restrictions about what quest givers he'll allow himself to speak to unless it, he would benefit from it, like, um, basically monetarily, like, in a really, really significant sense, or, I guess, sexually, because that's how those stories are sometimes. Um, another literary precedent for roleplay restrictions is Elric. The, uh, I think it's Elric of Melnibone, or however you say it, um, by Michael Moorcock. So that's the albino uh, character who... I wonder if I can pick that up. Oh, that was cool. Yeah, Elric is this powerful sorcerer, and he's the... Uh, and somebody's going to correct me in the comments, because I only read a couple of these stories, but he's the inheritor of some ancient empire full of evil wizards and shit. Um... And his empire has been controlled historically by controlling, like, or employing the use of evil spirits and demons and calling on them for sorcery. And so Elric will, while he's a great, powerful sorcerer, he only really exercises his powers in times of really, really great need. Besides that, danger fucking Warhammer. Awesome. Hell yeah. Um, okay. Let's see. Uh, <laughs> that's gonna... I'm, I'm so rich. I could just leave right now and it would be fine. Uh, but I, I came here to grind, basically. Um, yeah, it's just one roleplay role restriction. It's like Elric has, like, you know, 100 in destruction, mysticism, and restoration or something. But he just doesn't touch those spells unless he really absolutely has to. Um, besides that, he's just a kind of charismatic leader with a sword, a really magical sword that carries him. Um, but you get what I mean? All three of these uh, characters from fiction, they have like some roleplay restrictions that they engage with that uh, make them more interesting. So we can apply that to this game also. One of my favorites is just restricting the... Uh, the amount of magic you use to the schools that your character has been trained in. Um, now I'm saying the words trained in very deliberately there because, you know, you can get training in certain schools of magic um, if you really need to learn a spell. But for instance, let's take a look at my character. I'm a bandit. Um, I have like axe, lockpicking, and streetwise archery, short blade, backstabbing. I have nothing on my character sheet. 27 intelligence, Jesus. Um, I have nothing on my character sheet that indicates that I would be able to know how to cast spells and things like that. And yet if, you know, the game mechanics would allow me to, except for this disadvantage I have that makes my magicka disappear. Um, more tangibly, in Oblivion and Skyrim, regardless of what character you make, 
you're going to start with like one healing spell and one destruction spell. It makes sense from a game design perspective. Like you should just be able to survive without having to rest all the time or consume resources, I suppose. Um, but if you were to make like a um, this bandit character in Oblivion, why would you know how to use a healing spell? You know, why would you know how to send fire forth from your fingertips? So, you know, whenever I'm playing Oblivion or Skyrim, I simply refrain from using those uh, spell types unless I've trained in them for some reason or another. Um, usually this is by, you know, you choose your major skills and stuff like that, and you would choose destruction, mysticism, whatever you want to use. Um, but I've gotten pretty fond of getting some training once in a while. Oh man, I lost my train of thought because my baby started crying. Anyway, you shouldn't use. I, I don't like using magic that I'm not um, that is not in my class tree or that I'm not trained in. Um, there are some ways to get trained in some schools of magic in this game. I, I won't go into it in this video. Maybe in a future one. Um, but yeah, that's one common restriction is just not to use magic that you're not trained in. Um, besides that, I find it makes the game make a bit more sense if you eat, drink, and sleep regularly. I've almost always done this in Elder Scrolls games. Oh, there we go. Oh, there's a bat. Let's see. Um, you know, regardless of whether or not there's a uh, mod installed to incentivize like some survival mechanics. Oh, I'm actually kind of low on health. It just makes sense that your character wants to rest once in a while. Maybe whenever they drink they want beer, maybe they like wine. Um, if you're playing with climates and calories in this game, you have a lot of food and drink options, that's pretty cool. Uh, yeah, a, a common one is no fast travel, you know, and uh, this is more common in games like Skyrim or Oblivion when um, the world map is pretty small. Uh, let's see if there's anything else I need to do in these menus here. Um, just because they, you might find more dungeons and things like that as you walk around. You might encounter nice um, NPC encounters and things like that. Oh, I made my way back to the entrance somehow. I guess we should go rest up. Oh, I wanted to refill my oil too. And, you know, it's like uh, that corny cliche about, you know, it's about the friends you made along the way um, or things like that. It's uh, really true in these games where if you just fast travel all the time, you're going to miss a lot. You're going to miss, if nothing else, just the scenery that the developers have intended for you or have created for you. Fast travel is kind of an integral part of Daggerfall, but in Daggerfall Unity, you, you at least have mods like uh, travel options where you can travel over over the, you know, the map at like 30 times speed if you want. Um, it's still pretty dang tedious if you only fast travel like that and so I wouldn't recommend doing that all the time for example if you get a quest from uh, the nobility in Daggerfall to go to Shadungent in the Rothgarian mountains like that's going to still take a lot of, of your like IRL time away from you to do that so um, use that with your own discretion but for just traveling around the province I think it's pretty fun just to not fast travel and let travel options do the work for you if you're playing a character like a knight, then you obviously want your decisions to be guided by this uh, knightly valor. You wouldn't want to hurt innocent people. There are going to be some NPCs that you're going to be averse to hurting. And the quests that you accept from people in taverns are going to be like kind of modified by this as well. Because you get some quests to like smuggle goods and things like that. If you have a, go a code of honor, you're not going to want to do something that um, the Empire would frown upon, right? Um, this the texture there looks kind of like it would fall, but I, I don't think that's an elevator. Um, similarly, this guy is a bandit, so you notice like over here, uh, I think it's a major skill. I have backstabbing up there, uh, just because it's in his way to betray people whenever he can. It's just, you know, it's part of who he is. And this is a cute little gameplay mechanic manifestation of that betrayal, of that tendency to betray. Um, looks like there's a secret door over here. I'm tired of chugging my free action potions. If I keep this up, I might just leave. Uh, 
uh, yeah, besides that, a something that I would encourage, even if you're not playing an Iron Man run, is to limit the amount of times that you would, like, reload the game. Um, because, like I mentioned earlier, we're, we're humans, we have flaws, it's okay whenever we mess up, and sometimes the errors that we make are uh, more interesting than simple six, like, just simply succeeding. Now let's kill this guy so I can cook him and take a little break. Um, oh, I can't cook on this one? I thought I could cook on this one. Last time, it just kind of cooked instantly. Did that happen? Nope. All right, we're going to remove it. Not worry about it. I have some bread to eat. One time, whenever I was playing um, Oblivion, I think there was only one time where I really wanted to stick with the main quest, or uh, I mean the, uh, the Mage's Guild quest line. Um, so I was really devoted to that, and uh, I guess I misclicked or something. Uh, I can't grab onto that. <clears throat> and I ended up stealing something from one of my fellow uh, associates in the Mages Guild. I don't know if you've committed an offense like that in Oblivion, but they will drop your ass. Like, you should have get expelled for that. Um, and I think the, the punishment is to go around collecting alchemical ingredients. Okay, yeah, that hit him. That's good. I have a bow that works again. Yeah, you have to go around collecting like 100 of a couple of types of like alchemical ingredients that your character probably wants if you're in the Mage's Guild, but instead you just have to give them over to that snob who's in the Arcane University. And he's like, I hope you learned your lesson. And you just, you're actually pissed off as you play that moment. Um, oh, got him. All right. Let's turn around, let this guy burn his spell points. So obviously, if you get caught misclicking like I did and get expelled from the guild, you're like, oh, I deserve a reload, because that would make this a lot more bearable from a character's perspective. Uh, or from the player's perspective, I mean. Um, but even in real life, we get accused of bullshit. So I don't think that it's that bad if we um, misclick and something bad happens. Just because, you know, misunderstandings arise in real life. We're playing a Oh my gosh, that was a close call. Like, I really could have lost my character right there. I gotta... I thought he was out of spell points and was just sitting there or something. Um, yeah, misunderstandings arise in real life, so whenever you do something, even if it's like a misclick, you know, just assume that you, as a real person, have misclicked at some point, um, and a bad situation arose from it, and see what you can do to navigate that situation. Your character, you know, it's probably not going to be an endgame condition just because you misclicked. Um, so see how the situation plays out. It could be fun. Um, another time that I really got into a bad situation was, um, you know, there's a, a kind of delay between um, contracting a disease in Daggerfall and the time that you become aware of the disease. And um, <clears throat> so I was going around with a previous character. It was actually a character I had designed to be optimal for a change. And... Um, Let's, I have some resist fire potions. I should take one just to be uh, safe. Oh man, where are you? Where are you? Resist fire. Okay, I might have used them all. Um, that's whatever. Just leave this guy. So basically, I, I had a pretty viable character who contracted a couple of diseases without my knowledge. So I was going around questing. Um, talking to people in taverns, and they're like, oh yeah, if you want to get a quest, go to my buddy over here in the other tavern. I'm like, that's weird. Why didn't you just tell me what quest I wanted, I was going to get? I'm like, whatever. I go to the other tavern, and I talk to him, and the guy transforms into an orc shaman, and uh, he's, you get a dialogue prompt saying, like, um, some ikumbokum shit. Like, the dude's doing some incantations, and you eventually get teleported to a random spot, to a random dungeon, in the uh, that province and uh, so I get there I'm trapped inside of a tiny ass closet with a mummy um, and I'm you know feeling this bad sensation in my stomach in game I guess and like kind of feverish as I'm like thrashing against this damn mummy in this closet that has a locked door and um, so after I kill him just barely I figure out that I have stomach rot and the plague at the same time, with no way to cure these diseases. Like, I don't even know how I let this situation arise. Um, but I didn't know, like, where the exit of the dungeon was. And I guess for some god-awful reason, I didn't have an anchor set. Because, like, 
I should have just warped out of there. Um, but that wasn't an option for whatever reason. So I had two diseases. Um, my s Oh no, something broke. My stats were just steadily dropping because of these diseases, and so there is like this urgency to get out of the dungeon on time, uh, to get back to a temple, uh, or to at least find a cure disease potion. I didn't want to rest to get any magicka back because you know resting while you're diseased is just a terrible idea, and this was absolutely terrifying. In addition to being interesting, um, and I just I just love whenever Daggerfall pulls some shit like that on you. Now I know about that quest giver and I I don't fall for the trap as often but that first time that it happened whenever I had like two diseases I ended up being teleported into a room with like a, a locked door and a mummy it was just kind of hilarious how terribly things went um, and that's exactly what I'm talking about you know I could have just gone on another go to the dungeon get the item and bring it back sort of quest but instead this random ass occurrence popped up and all the ailments that I had like made the situation even more difficult and I could have just reloaded my quick save because I, I really quick save like crazy in this game but instead you know I just decided to see it through if you lose the character you lose the character or if you know you don't come out very well with a bunch of loot or anything like that at least your character has like a bunch of cool stories to tell because of it right um, so some more examples of the way emergent narrative can appear in your game or the way roleplay restrictions can appear I press the elevator button was it just this oh that was bad um, is being a bit selective with the loot you grab like I have to, I'm just carrying around a Daedra heart right now do you ever think about that how weird Daedra hearts are as a piece of loot if um, I was like a Kinnereth fearing man and I found a Daedra heart I would just pass that thing by right like um, this is a kind of weird thing to keep with you if you're playing a character who's like pious or doesn't want the influence of some Daedra lurking about them. Um, alternatively, some of the most valuable loot in the game are those holy daggers you find. At least, they, they have a really good value to weight ratio, at least. Um, but if you are like a Daedra worshipper who's trying to join one of the witch covens in the Iliac Bay, you would probably get a sickening sensation whenever you pass by that holy dagger um, and wouldn't want to pick it up. Uh, so that's just like a little thing you can do. You can, if you're using the Realistic Wagons mod from Ralsar, it's a really great one, I recommend it. Uh, but it makes it so that whenever you're using your wagon, you actually have to go at the slow ass speed provided by the wagon. Whereas, you know, and uh, without this mod, you could pull your wagon around at the speed that your horse runs. Um, I wonder if this is going to fall out from beneath me. Um, so, choosing whether to go around on foot, like Wades and Reeds, my character that you might have saw in my last video, um, to go around on a horse, or to um, use a wagon or a ship. Even these minor differences can add some variety and flavor to your character. Um, and you probably have seen the character, the awesome character customization in the uh, uh, Classmaker, and this has a lot of roleplay options embedded in it. I won't go over it much in this video because um, Adventure Art has a really cool video about making funny, janky characters in uh, Daggerfall that I'd, I shouldn't really try to repeat something that he's already done so well. I'll put a link for that video if I can in the, uh, the description here. Because um, if, if you like Daggerfall content, his channel is like something you have to check out. Um, so another thing I want to bring up... Oh, fucking ghosts. I'm tired of fighting them. I'll see if I can climb out of here in time. Yeah, yeah. He floats, so he might follow me. Oh, yeah, he followed me. Okay. Let's switch. Using my bow here so I don't get paralyzed, ideally. Um... This is something I picked up whenever I was playing old school Dungeons and Dragons for the first time, as opposed to like fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons. I, I'm a bit of a writer, and so I would write these huge, elaborate backstories. Oh, this is my second enchanted torque. Interesting. Um, this one is it fortifies your speed, and so I, it's like the best thing ever. I'm trying not to use it unless um, something. It's like a really dangerous main quest dungeon or something. Um, uh, yeah, so 
I used to write these huge elaborate backstories in Elder Scrolls as well as like fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons. And then I started playing uh, older editions of Dungeons and Dragons where your character is not guaranteed to survive the session. Normally, like in fifth edition or something like that, there's this kind of unspoken agreement where as long as you don't make any blatant blunders with your character, you, you're not going to have your character get killed. Like, it's kind of an unspoken rule that your character is not going to die unless your actions deliberately lead to it, even if the dice would otherwise kill you. Um, not all dungeon masters roll the game this way, but um, generally, like, as a dungeon master, I've definitely had people get upset just because their actions led to their character's death, and I'm like, I, I don't know what you want, man. Um, in old school Dungeons and Dragons, your characters are frail as hell whenever they're initially rolled. So if I were to spend a long time writing an elaborate backstory in that situation, like I'm just going to be upset whenever that character dies. Um, and I'm like, oh, my hard work of the backstory, and yet it's kind of my own fault for writing such an elaborate backstory to begin with. I'm saying all this just to say, like, you don't have to have an elaborate backstory to enjoy your role-playing experience. Instead, allow the gameplay itself to inform your roleplay experience. Like, after this, my character, oh dang, uh, might be a little racist toward orcs after seeing so many shamans and getting his ass kicked so many times and being pushed to the brink of death. Um, or, you know, you might have a certain paranoia or phobia of certain enemies that you've encountered. Um, Another example of somebody's backstory being crafted in the middle of the gameplay is like, um, I'm mean, going talk about adventure art a lot, by the way. I like the guy's channel a lot. If you've seen the Mad Genius playthrough, you know that some people mistreat him in the Daggerfall Palace, and so he comes up with all these, like, conniving schemes to betray and, like, anger and destroy the people in the Daggerfall Palace, and it's just absolutely hilarious, and it's not like... He rolled up the character and was like, hmm, I bet this guy is going to be really angry at the people in Daggerfall. Um, it just arose naturally, you know, and that's part of the beauty of it, especially if you re-roll characters a lot like I do. Um, letting the gameplay itself inform your roleplay decisions um, and your character's personality is just, it's so, I don't want to say magical, that's kind of corny, but it's so fantastical and magical, I don't care how corny it is, I, I just love that kind of gameplay style. Um, yeah, doing this will end up having um, dynamic characters for you. Maybe you end up sympathizing with certain character groups because, like, a giant helped you beat an orc that was about to kill you, and you're forever changed by this event. Um, just like we are dynamic as people and we grow, uh, at least we should, um, so can our characters grow and change over time. And uh, it's part of the fun, it's part of the beauty. You know, if you start off the game with like a, an aversion to Daedra, like you can literally choose that from your class generator, um, you might eventually overcome this fear and um, be more comfortable. And you, I guess you can't take away the mechanical aspect of it, but you can stop being such a a little bitch whenever a Daedra Lord shows up, if you've encountered them and you know how to fight them. Um, like I mentioned with the adventure art story, you might develop some grudges that you hold on to, which creates for some pretty funny situations. Um, and sometimes uh, some of the ways you grow or change over time are just the cool purchases you make. You might have a, a house or a ship that you're saving up for for a very long time or something like that. Um, or maybe you're trying to get fully decked out in an ebony suit of armor. Stuff like that just shows some changes in your character. Um, that last one's a bit more material than the personality that I mentioned earlier. Um, but it's it still kind of applies. Uh, the point is, your, your character's going to change and grow over time, and that's cool. That's that's perfect. That's ideal. Um, we, we change and grow over time, so should our characters. These role-playing games, they emulate real life. And we should allow that to happen instead of creating only optimized characters. Um, and so I, these um, emergent narratives, they show up whenever you least expect them. And I'm not saying that's not the only aspect of the game you should focus on. This character, even as I'm talking about emergent narratives, he's grinding through the main quest one way or another. Um, you should still try to level up in factions and do the main quest and stuff like that if that's what you're into. Oh no, I forgot my campfire and I think it doesn't stay persistent with persistent dungeons. That's kind of upsetting. Um, let me put on another cloak here. 
Yeah, yeah you, you can, can still, still do, do all the, um, you know, main quest and faction quests that you want to do while allowing for um, roleplay restrictions and emergent narratives. Sometimes you might consider who you re you receive your quest from as a kind of determining factor for um, your character based on their personality. Like if you're a, an aspiring knight, you might want to uh, just get quests from the nobility. Like go into the local palace in your province and um, see if they have some basic quests for you. Um, oh man, did I just fall through the map? Or is it super dark? I think it's just super dark. That's good. Um, quick save. Continue our travel to this city here. Or let's actually there's a tavern that's a farmstead. Farmstead. Um, let's look at just towns. And I'm at right here. Okay, this is actually probably the closest. Let's go. Um, so yeah, it, or if this guy's a bandit that I'm playing right now, I actually, this is the first character who's completely unaffiliated with factions. Uh, the Fighters Guild or the Thieves Guild, maybe even Assass uh, the Dark Brotherhood, could have made a bit of sense for this guy, but I think it's um, a bit more logical for him to just not want to have his loyalty with any entity at all. Um, and so he's just, he's his only master, right? Um, maybe um, he, he just gets quests from like the taverns basically and commoners. Um, if you have a high mercantile skill, then maybe you get your quests from like merchants or you would, I guess, um, there's a, maybe you join the temple of Zenithar and things like that. Uh, you see what I mean? Like you don't have to take every quest as it comes just because you're playing a game that dishes out quests. Your character would be averse to some of these things and more prone to others. And, um, you know, that's, that's part of the, the beauty of it. That's way, the way you can kind of force some uh, replay value to exist in your game. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to just, like, rest up at a tavern over here. Where are we? Are we near a tavern? There's actually not a tavern in this town. That is, that's pretty messed up. I don't think I've seen that before. Um, anyway, I, I hope this puts things a little bit into perspective about, like, um, the way role-playing can make your playthrough a bit more fun and a bit more diverse than um, maybe your previous playthrough or someone else's playthrough, things like that. Um, and the way it can generate replay value and s simply meaningful experiences to allow um, some emergent narrative to take place in your game. All right, um, it's getting kind of spooky. I need to rest outside the city walls or climb them and leave my horse outside for a minute. Um, yeah, anyway, that's, that's, my, that's my TED Talk about emergent narrative and uh, roleplay restrictions. I hope you liked it. So I realized that I introduced the topic of uh, having personal goals for your character and like ambitions to keep them sort of guided, but didn't elaborate them uh, on that a bit further whenever I was recording previously. So I switched on over to good old Wades and Reads, um, my Argonian hand-to-hand -hand master to um, just elaborate on that subject a little bit. Um, so in addition to your usual goals like there's nothing wrong with just wanting to become the master of a certain guild or something like that or uh, complete the main quest but I like it I think it's kind of fun to have some sub goals within that to um, guide your uh, experience some to keep you focused on some sort of um, some sort of grind outside of the usual gameplay loop uh, for Wades and Reads this was um, becoming a master of hand-to-hand -hand and um, Thankfully, I was able to do that. This is uh, the first time I've ever gotten a skill to 100. It's kind of neat. Um, another example of that would be uh, on the bandit character that I was playing with previously. He really wants to be like sort of a bandit lord type of character. So, oh, vampire is challenging me. Let's try to kick her off. Okay. Sometimes it's fun whenever I'm accepting challengers on the mountaintop to like boot them off of it, but that doesn't always work out like that. Um, yeah, there's the village in the distance. Yeah, um, so this other character, the bandit, wants to be a bandit lord. This involves his streetwise skill and finding a dungeon where there are a lot of like um, rogues and stuff like that. I have god mode enabled so that Climbing and Galleries doesn't kill me while I'm talking, by the way. Um, 
there's a bunch of rogues or thieves that I can pacify and make this the place where I go and drop off my loot using persistent dungeons to keep like the loot alive there for a while. Um, you know, that it's just a little kind of aesthetic choice that you can make for the character that makes sense for them. Maybe if you're a power mad sorcerer, you just you're obsessed with getting the soul of a Daedra Lord into a soul gem. Um, little goals like this and ambitions help guide what skills you progress in, uh, what gear you buy, and ultimately how you pilot your character. Alright, um, to finish off, I'm going to do some classic Wades and Reeds base jumping. Uh, this is one of his favorite pastimes, just kind of waiting until he's about to splat, and then finding a slow fall potion. Uh, there we go. Let's turn off the HUD. Ah. Uh, Beautiful. Wades and Reeds in his element. Gotta love it. Alright, well, um, I'm signing off for all this time. Uh, I'll talk to y'all in the next video.